technical difficulties. It always happens when it rains. Um, welcome to Central Villages this morning. It's so wonderful to see so many people here today. It's very exciting um, to be able to be here in person and um, we welcome those also who are online. We're going to start our service today by singing God's praises together. So please stand and join with us as we sing.
that amazing our God is able our God is willing um, let's before we sit down say this prayer of thanksgiving together please join with me almighty God creator and redeemer we praise you for your work of creation for the beauty of the world around us and for every gift we enjoy we thank you for creating us to know you love you and obey you most of all, we thank you for sending your Son to die for us and to give us life in all its fullness. Accept, O oh God, our praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please take your seats. As it is the last Sunday of the school holidays, we are still running our KC school holiday program. There are packs up the back for kids if they have not yet grabbed one. Um, please do. There is the word of the day. I have been told the word of the day is harvest. Okay, harvest. For those of you who've got the older kid booklet, the word you're looking for, harvest. So just remember that. Um, we're now going to have some news. Um, it's so wonderful to always have people coming um, and new people, people who've been through here for a while. We've got our welcome and next step cards. If you wanted to get in touch with us, if you're new and you want to find out more about Central Villages, what we're about, the things we do, the ministries that we provide, um, then by all means, please fill out the welcome card. We've got physical versions up the back, just next to Nick there. Um, and we also have an electronic copy on the website. And um, we also have our next step cards. If you've been here for a while and you really want to get a bit more involved, you want to join a Bible study, you want to know about any programs that we've got, like Single Minded or Hope Explored, um, fill one of those ones out. Again, we've got physical and electronic copies. Um, if you do fill out a physical one, you can pop it in the everything box up the back. Um, and yeah, please let us know, get in contact with us. You could be letting us know what we can pray for you for as well. Um, so anything that you want to get in touch with, updating details, just let us know if, through those cards. Um, the key audit. Today is the last day to hand back the keys with your name and what you need them for to M. Um, we are doing an audit of all our keys. We're making sure they all work. We're making sure that people who, who need keys have the right keys. Um, over time, as many of us are aware, we end up with a pile of keys and we're not sure what goes with what lock. And it turns out sometimes that the lock the key went with is long gone. So we just want to make sure um, that all of our keys are in working order. We know how many keys are out there and who's got them. We also have the lock box, which is down the back um, for those who need to get in on the odd occasion. Um, if you need the code to that, please ask the office or, or one of the wardens. Um, do remember to put the key back in the lock box once you're done because <laughs> then it, we know that it's there for the next person as well. Uh, Central Nights, such an exciting um, privilege that we have to host Central Nights for the young adult Christians from 18 to 35 throughout the entire of the Blue Mountains. Um, we're hosting this again on the November the 5th, the Saturday night, um, and we have special guest Olivia Bush who will be talking about mental health and um, what, lo what looking after others as a Christian actually looks like. Sometimes we have an idea of what it might look like um, and, and sometimes it, it is com like comparable to the Bible, but sometimes it's actually a little bit different. 
Um, so she'll be talking about that. It should be a wonderful night. It's $10 entry with dinner provided. So if you would like to come to that, then pop that date in your diaries. It should be a brilliant night. Cherished, the women's event is coming up again, afternoon tea, on the 22nd of October. This one's from 2 till 4 p.m. Um, please come along. This is for all of the women of Central Villages. You can also invite someone if you like. Um, it's just a wonderful afternoon of sitting with each other in fellowship, chatting, having tea and coffee and nibblies together. Last time it was a craft um, event and we all just had our... There was sewing, there was knitting, there was painting, there was all sorts of things going on. Um, and it's just a wonderful time for um, the different generations to come together and have fellowship with one another. Uh, pledging. This is coming up next week. You will find out more about this next week. I know we're making you wait, aren't we? It's all right. So next week at each of the services, the wardens will be talking about pledging and there will be some forms coming out for you to fill out. So please keep that on your mind and in your prayers as to how you may be able to assist. Um, there is a barbecue today. The weather has turned nice and we have managed to get some volunteers to cook. So that is wonderful. Please hang around after the service um, and join in fellowship after morning tea with the barbecue lunch. I'm now going to invite Paul up to lead us in prayer. Oh, Kids Church. There's more Kids Church. Sorry. Yeah, so there's no Kids Church on today, but we, will ha we are having a kids spot and we've got a couple of things set up. So we've got tables around. Downstairs, we are also running the stream. So that's kind of an overflow for parents. We love your kids, but we understand that it is a bit struggle to keep your kids in here at some stage. So there is an overflow down there where you can watch one as well. But we're going to watch a video about the lost sheep. Uh, and this is a kid's video. So, um, yes, this doesn't count as the words harvest. Harvest is before the sermon when that starts. Um, but, yes, we're going to watch a video now. We're going to do prayers as we try and get this going. I do apologise. Uh, I think Paul's going to come up and lead us in prayer. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. We, um, we probably should start by praying for the guys that are trying to... Father, please help the uh, sound and video guys to... Uh, to make sure that they all work. I'm Paul, and today uh, I'll be, we'll be praying together to God.
Jesus. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. We pray for comfort and solace, especially for Brenda and Irene and their family. Thank you that we can meet Nariah and others we love in a reunion that will last for eternity. Father, we pray for healing for those who are sick and unwell or recovering from illness and for those who are grieving, for those who are feeling lonely or feeling isolated. We pray for those among us who are suffering. Father, bring them rest and healing. We pray for Brendan and Irene, for Mel, for Isabel Hurley, for Belinda. We commit them and others on our hearts to you now. Father, please heal and comfort your family, your children. Bring us peace in body and mind and spirit. Father, thank you for all the blessings we've received over this last week. Bless the churches in the mountains around us. Please lift them up to you. Strengthen them. Help us to help them in the work that they're doing. We pray that mountains communities would be loved truly loved by the churches in them and that people would be brought to know you. Father, thank you that our kids have had a rest from school and more time to be with uh, us, their families. Help them to be ready to go back this week and thank you for parents. Thank you for perseverance. We pray that as the kids' programs, the kids' church, Bounce, Standout Youth, we pray that as they resume, that the kids will focus on you and the leaders focused on you will guide those that attend in their growth and their walk with Christ. Lord, we praise you today because you are both our creator and our redeemer. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know our strengths. You know our failures. You know the ways in which we need help. Please build us up. Make us more like Jesus. Patient. Gentle. Loving others sacrificially. And you most fully. Amen. Good morning. My name is Rob. I'll be bringing the Bible to us this morning. Our reading comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 to 38. That's Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 to 38. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Hi, greetings from Armadale. Uh, some time ago, Tom asked me if I put together a sermon for you to be played following his departure from Wilson to serve up in the UNE chapel in the Armadale Diocese. I was glad to do so, as I was keen to 
put the changes that are taking place for your parish uh, into a bigger picture. Now I know at one level nothing I say today will necessarily soothe the sadness that you all feel over losing Tom and Alison and the family, but my hope is that this talk will help you frame your current season of grief in the light of the huge task at hand in reaching rural Australia with the Gospel. Now, as many of you would know, Tom has had a long-standing interest in Gospel ministry into the rest of Australia. Having been on the board of BCA for almost eight years, he is acutely aware of the Gospel needs around our vast country. In mid-September, I'll be he heading to Moore College in Sydney with the National Director of BCA, Greg Harris, and a posse of rural bishops, including Mark Calder from Bathurst, the Bishop-elect of Northwest Australia, Darrell Parker, and uh, me, the Bishop of Armidale. But we're going to Moore College to present a plan to recruit, train, and send a new generation of gospel workers to vacant Anglican parishes all over the country. Now at the moment the challenges seem overwhelming, but of course we aren't the first to feel it. In the passage before us today in Matthew 9, we're given a glimpse of the overwhelming mission task at hand for those very first disciples of Jesus. My prayer is that as we unpack this well-known passage today, we'll be struck by the work of Jesus moved by the heart of Jesus and spurred into action by the challenge of Jesus to play our part in mission both locally and globally. Well, let's start by considering the work of Jesus. Look with me, if you will, at verse 35 of Matthew 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So this verse is really a summary of what has gone before in Matthew's Gospel. After Jesus' baptism by John in chapter 3 and then his temptations in the wilderness in chapter 4, Jesus begins his public preaching ministry in the region of Galilee. And so Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Around the same time, Jesus called his first disciples while walking beside the Sea of Galilee. They went with him and he launched into an itinerant ministry summarised for us in uh, Matthew 4 verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Notice that that ministry description in chapter 4 is almost identical to the one in chapter 9. So what did the preaching and teaching of Jesus look like? Well, chapters 5 to 7 of Matthew's Gospel show us the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it was teaching like the crowds had never heard before, as Jesus unpacked what it meant to be part of the kingdom of God under the kingship of the Lord Jesus. And so we read in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority not as their teachers of the law. So the crowds loved Jesus' teaching and they lapped it up. They could see Jesus was different. It was like he was speaking with the authority of God himself. Could this be the Messiah? Could it be the long-awaited son of David? Could it be the son of God? God the son? Well, the authority seen in the way Jesus spoke was powerfully backed up by the authority he showed in the things he did as well. He healed every disease and sickness among the people. And as you read on in Matthew's Gospel, we see Jesus heal everything from leprosy through to the common cold. He healed all comers, paralysis victims, people with fevers, the woman with long-term bleeding, the man who was blind. He even brought a dead girl back to life. He also had authority over the wind and the waves, authority over demons, and even proved he had God's authority to forgive sins. No wonder Jesus was drawing a crowd wherever he went. The people loved to see his work. Can you imagine today if Jesus arrived in Lawson or in Hazelbrook or Katoomba and 
He began healing and restoring people in this way. Word would get around, wouldn't it? It would be standing room only everywhere Jesus turned up. So just imagine he turned up at uh, the Blue Mountains District Hospital and then he worked his way through the wards, healing people, everyone he encountered. You can see the headlines now in the local paper, can't you? Jesus sorts out Blue Mountains healthcare crisis. It truly was an incredible ministry. And as the disciples and the crowds heard the words of Jesus and saw the signs of Jesus, they glimpsed what life would be like under God's chosen king. The king had arrived. The kingdom of heaven had come near. Now was the time to turn from sin and to trust and obey God's king Jesus. So the kingdom work had begun with this itinerant ministry of Jesus, but that was just the beginning. And the more Jesus ministered, the more he saw and felt the need. So look with me at verse 36 now of uh, chapter 9. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So here we see the heart of Jesus for the lost sheep of Israel. Now the background to this verse is to be found in Ezekiel 34, where we see that the shepherds of Israel had long neglected the flock entrusted to them by God. Look with me, at, uh, if you will, uh, briefly at Ezekiel 34 verse 2. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Then verse 4 goes on. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. So the prophet Ezekiel was speaking 600 years before Jesus. He's depicting God's people as sheep who've been neglected. Sheep who were maimed and who were scattered. And back then, none of Israel's shepherds, her prophets, priests or kings, seemed to care. But... Ezekiel speaks of a time that would come when the Lord himself would seek out his sheep. He would care for them and bring them back. He, he himself would shepherd the flock. So in Ezekiel 30 verse, 34 verse 11, we read this. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. Can you see how Jesus is the fulfilment of Ezekiel's prophecy? Matthew 9 verse 36 makes plain that the Lord himself, the shepherd of Israel, has come. So what God was planning back then has come to pass in the arrival of Jesus. He strengthens the weak. He heals the sick. He brings back the lost because Jesus is the long-awaited shepherd of Ezekiel 34. And what is he like? Uh, what motivates this shepherd in his ministry? What gets him up in the morning to do the shepherd's work? Compassion. Compassion ignited by seeing the need. Look again with me at Matthew 9.36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That word compassion means he was moved in his guts stirred deep down inside. He saw the situation. People were tormented, they were exhausted, they were led astray by the dodgy leadership of that day, bound up with legalistic burdens that were impossible to carry, caught up in the hollow religiosity that had lost sight of the true intent of God's word. And Jesus perceived their need, as Ezekiel had done before him. And he was moved with compassion from deep down in here to search for and secure, to seek and to save lost sheep, that he might be their shepherd, Lord and King. Friends, Christ-like compassion is the supreme motivation for mission. It's right when we see the desperate need of those who are perishing outside of God's kingdom to feel Christ-like compassion. A deep felt compassion that, that motivates us to play our part in order to share the love of God and the hope of heaven that are only found in Jesus. 
You know, I find the heart of Jesus for the lost a tremendously encouraging and yet incredibly challenging at the same time. Encouraging because when I was lost, I know he sought me and saved me and made me his own. When I struggle, he comforts and strengthens me to persevere. When I wander, he wakes me up and brings me home. So the heart of Jesus for the lost is encouraging for me and indeed for all who have come to know Jesus as their shepherd. But on the other hand, the heart of Jesus is also challenging because I see his compassion, uh, his gut-felt desire to seek and to save the lost and I long for my heart to be like his. See, God has made me a shepherd of his people, an under-shepherd of Jesus, the great shepherd, but you know, the same is true for all gospel ministers, clergy, Bible study group leaders, youth group leaders, Sunday school teachers, Christian parents and even grandparents as well. The reality is we've all been entrusted with varying levels of responsibility as under shepherds of the great shepherd. Now, I don't know about you, but the truth about me uh, is that my motives as an under shepherd are mixed. Unlike Jesus, I struggle with pride and selfishness. But I read this passage and feel the challenge to have his heart for the lost. I mean, wouldn't it be great if heartfelt compassion for the lost were the thing that got me out of bed in the morning? Wouldn't it be great if everything I did was motivated by love for God and others? Wouldn't it be great if I could keep that as the main gain in life and live for the glory of God and for the good of his people? Well, Jesus was like that. Sadly, I'm not consistently like that. And if you're honest, neither of you. But the good news is that Jesus can forgive us for our failures. He can use us, even in our frailty, to play our part in the work of his kingdom. So when we trust in Jesus as Saviour and agree to live with him as Lord, he does forgive us and change us. And over time, with the help of his Spirit, Jesus will transform us to love the things he loves and to hate the things he hates. Friends, do you have the heart of Jesus for those who are lost? When you go out into the world from here today, back to your neighbourhood, into your workplace, Will you have eyes to see those who are lost? When you head to the local sports ground to watch your kids or grandkids play sport, will you feel Christ-like compassion on the crowds who don't yet know Jesus? You know, the heart of change is a change of heart. As followers of Christ, we need to ask him to help us to become more like him in his heart for the lost. But the good news is, Jesus hears and answers that kind of prayer. And by his Spirit, he will help us to have his heart for the lost when we ask him. Well, prayer for a change of heart is the right place to start. And we all need that if we're to respond rightly to the challenge of Jesus. Which brings us to the third point there on your sermon outline as we come to consider verses 37 and 38. Look at it with me. Then he said to his disciples... The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. To get the picture, uh, move with compassion for the crowds who are like sheep without a shepherd, and comprehending the extent of the mission task that lies ahead, Jesus now turns to his disciples and says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It's a wonderful sight in spring when... I travel around our diocese in the northwest to see the fruit of a good season. The harvest is not far away, and I can see in most places in our patch this year it's going to be plentiful. But I can imagine if I were a farmer, there would be few better things than looking over a huge paddock with a plentiful crop ripe for harvest. Now, of course, it's not in the bank until it's off the paddock and to the silo or to the grain delivery point. To bring in a plentiful harvest, you need harvest workers ready to go at the right time. Well, the same is true when it comes to labourers for the gospel harvest. 
When Jesus first said these famous words, his kingdom work was about to move from phase one to phase two. A phase one had been Jesus doing the work of preaching the good news of the kingdom. He'd been doing all the teaching and healing, as we saw in verse 35. But now phase two is about to kick in. At the start of chapter 10, Jesus gives his closest disciples, the 12 apostles, the authority to do the things he alone has been doing to date. So the plan is that the kingdom work will now multiply. In Luke's gospel, we learn that a while later, he then sent out the 72 with the same challenge. Uh, Luke 10 verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And so the kingdom work is taken into phase three with the sending of the 72. And then right at Matt, the end of Matthew's gospel, we have yet another phase of the kingdom work kicking into gear with the Great Commission. You remember it? Jesus has gathered the apostles again and his final instructions to them before he ascends into heaven are these. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. With this great commission, of course, the scope of the mission and the size of the harvest field broadens from Israel to every people group on the planet. So what began as good news for Israel was to become good news for all nations. And so it did. Beginning in the Middle East, then spreading to Europe and Spain, Africa, India, China, and eventually to America and Australia and everywhere else around the Pacific, Indian and Atlantic Oceans, that work, of course, continues. Because everywhere the good news of Jesus has been proclaimed and people have become disciples of Christ, they too, in the light of the universal authority of the risen Lord Jesus, have been commanded to make disciples of all nations. It's why that it's right in parishes right across Sydney Diocese and Armidale Diocese it's right that we keep our eyes fixed on both the local and the global mission. We strive to continue the work that the apostles began under the instruction from Jesus in Matthew 9 and then again in Matthew 28. And so the challenge of Jesus to his disciples back then becomes our challenge as his disciples now. The harvest is still plentiful and the workers are still few. What there should, for should we do? Look at Jesus' instructions, verse 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. What should we do? Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Do you see, prayer is the starting point for the action plan. We need to ask the Lord of, our, of the harvest, that is our Heavenly Father, to raise up and send out workers into the gospel harvest field. Friends, the truth is we need more harvest workers now than ever to take up gospel ministry opportunities around the world. Do you know I was on the CMS website recently and I saw a video that featured uh, former missionary Peter Blowers and he said this, in every generation there is a whole new world population to reach with the gospel. That line struck me powerfully. And it reminded actually, me actually of a, something I'd heard years ago from the Christian musician and modern day prophet Keith Green. He said this, this generation of believers is responsible for this generation of souls. We're responsible for them. Now, while I was on the CMS website, I looked briefly at uh, the global opportunities for service. And I noted that there were 70 gospel worker positions waiting to be filled. Uh, here in Australia, and particularly in rural regions, we also have significant need for more gospel workers. Right now, uh, in our diocese, we have uh, resources to place up to five ministers straight out of theological next year to work as curates in parishes around northwest New South Wales 
And at the moment I have uh, one, possibly two signed up to serve. I need at least three more. Uh, further afield in the Bathurst Diocese, Bishop Mark Calder has 14 parishes with, without clergy. Uh, we're looking to partner with him to send trained curates from the Armdale Diocese in years to come because in the Bathurst Diocese they only have one trained parish. Now I'm glad to announce that at the end of this year we will send our first fully trained curate to Bathurst uh, to get that, um, that vision activated. Now I mentioned at the start of this talk that a number of dioceses are now working in partnership with BCA seeking to get better organised with theological college recruitment, training and sending. But, you know, we also need uh, legwork done in a very important other sphere to raise up gospel workers for the harvest. And, and friends, this is where Tom comes in as the new chaplain at the University of New England. This is a key training and sending ground at an earlier level than theological college. Tom, I know, has both the heart and the vision to equip and train Christian students who come to our rural university in Armidale that they might then go on to serve in both regional and remote churches right around Australia. Some of those students will head out as young professionals. They'll work alongside ministers in rural towns to further gospel ministry. Some others will also find their way into our theological colleges and then become the next generation of Christian ministers in rural Australia. The reality is that people who have come from the country are more likely to return to the country to serve. And so the University in Armidale is a vital training and sending ground. Now, having been involved with BCA for many years, Tom understands the challenges of raising up gospel workers for rural and remote parishes in Australia. And when I spoke with him about this over a year ago, I could see the potential for him being very effective in this space. Now, I know that your loss uh, is clearly our gain, but I want you to see today that it's also a much broader gospel gain for the whole of God's church in Australia. Please pray with me that God will richly bless Tom and Alison's ministry at the UNE Chapel in Armidale. Please pray with me that the Lord of the Harvest will raise up workers for the gospel harvest from our patch, uh, both for rural gospel work around Australia and indeed for wider gospel work around the world. Uh, you pray for those things. I'll be praying at the same time that God will raise up just the right gospel man to lead you here in Lawson as well. Well, I hope that you can see that the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. I trust that you're persuaded of how vital it is to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into his harvest field. But in all of this, we do well to remember that it is his harvest. That is, it doesn't all depend on us. That's a relief, isn't it? We are not the lords of the harvest, God is. But we are called to pray. Our compassion starts with praying. But we also need to realise that our praying will lead us to consider the part that we might play ourselves as workers in God's harvest. And that's certainly been my experience over the years. Perhaps it's yours as well. Sometimes people become the answer to their own prayers. But you know what? It shouldn't surprise us because that is exactly what happened to Jesus' first disciples. Their master urged them to pray for harvest workers at the end of chapter 9 and they ended up going out as harvest workers at the start of chapter 10. So what about you? Will you start with prayer? Will you pray with me for Christ-like compassion for the lost? For the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers for his harvest both locally and globally? Friends, let's not be overwhelmed by the task that lies before us we have a very powerful God. Let's pray to him now as I finish. Dear Heavenly Father, we can see that the harvest is plentiful, uh, but the workers are few. Uh, please give us Christ-like compassion for those who are wandering and lost. 
We know that you are the Lord of the harvest and that it's your harvest field. But in your kindness, Father, please raise up godly gospel workers so that they can be sent out into your harvest. We thank you, Lord, for Tom Melbourne and his family. Thank you for the excellent work that they've done here in Lawson. And thank you for calling them now to serve in Armidale at the Uni Church. Please strengthen them by your Holy Spirit for the work ahead. Please use them to raise up many gospel workers for rural Australia and for around the world. And we pray also, Lord, that you will protect your people here in Lawson. Please raise up for them a godly shepherd who will love your people and preach your word faithfully. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What a wonderful message and definitely something to keep in our prayers. We are now going to have one more try at that kid's video. Hopefully it works and then after this we'll be singing. If you want to watch that at home, that's from Saddleback's Kids on YouTube and it'll be the Stories of the Bible series. Please stand and join us as we sing our final songs together.
time spent with scripture and praise and fellowship. Um, please continue on with that fellowship with morning tea and then the barbecue. Um, let's say together the words of the grace from the Second Corinthians. May the, May grace, the grace of the of Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. What beautiful words. Have a wonderful week, everyone. I hope to see you next Sunday.